just want to thank you for the time you can meet with us here tonight. And Lord, we just ask that you bless our study as we continue in the book of Revelation. And uh, Father, we just give you thanks and praise for taking care of us, for watching over us. Uh, Lord, we want to thank you for the ones you've healed today. Uh, Viviana is back home, and we thank you that uh, she no longer is in the hospital. And just ask that uh, you watch over her and Timothy and the babies tonight. And uh, bless them, Lord. And bless Marcia today as we talked. Father God, uh, keep her healthy and safe, I pray. And we'll thank you and praise you for all you're doing for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Continue to pray for Marcia, if you would. And Viviana's fine. She had a, uh, something with her blood, and by the time the doctors tried to figure it out, God healed her. So, <laughs> of course, they took the credit, but... <laughs> okay. We're in uh, Revelation chapter 1 still. Next week, we'll start with the seven churches that uh, God... Uh, some rebukes and some he commends them. But we'll start with that in chapter 2 next week. This week we're going to start with uh, chapter 1, verse 12. And we'll go down to the end of the chapter. So John says, and, and remember I said this was a progressive story. It goes from this point to that point and it's all in order. So verse 12 proves that. He says, Then I turned to see the voice that spoke with me, and having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the middle of the seven lampstands, there was one like the Son of Man, who was clothed with a garment down to the feet and girded about the chest with a golden band. His head and hair were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes like a flame of fire. His feet were like fine brass, as if it refined in the furnace, and his voice was like the sound of many waters. He had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went the sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was like the sun shining in its strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. But he laid his right hand on me and said, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am he who lives and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of Hades and of death. Write the things which you have seen, and the things which are, and the things which will take place after this. The mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand, and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels or messengers of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands which you saw are the seven churches. So let's go back and take a look at this. Um, I call this the prophecies, these next verses here. Uh, it'll be messages to the seven churches in Asia. And so it was called Asia then, now it's modern day Turkey. And all seven of these churches are found in mainland Turkey. Um, and of course, John was on the island of Patmos. And on, how you doing, brother? <laughs> hey, good to see you. And on the island of uh, Patmos uh, is right off the west coast of, um, of Turkey. So let's take a look at the seven golden candlesticks. Uh, again, what are they? Well, verse 20 answers that. The seven golden uh, lampstands and and, uh, are the seven churches. So we want to look at verse 13, chapter 1 and verse 13. In the midst of the churches is Jesus. And man, that is so important to understand that the Lord is with us wherever we go. He said, I'll never leave you or forsake you. I'll never walk away from you. So every time we gather together, he's right here in the midst of us. And every time you personally walk out that door, he walks out with you. Yeah, he'll never leave you or forsake you. So in verse 13... In the midst of the churches is Jesus. So let's take a look at Matthew chapter 18. Matthew 18 and verse 20. So the last chapter in Matthew. And we want to look at verse 20. 
I'll bet everybody gets there before me. <laughs> okay. Eighteen twenty says, "For where there are two or three gathered together in my name, I am there in the midst." So I like Matthew eighteen verses nineteen and twenty. Nineteen says, "If any two of us agree." is touching anything on this earth, it'll be done for us by our Father which is in heaven. So whatever we agree on together, of course, according to his will, if you ask for a Rolls Royce, I doubt whether you're going to get it, unless you have a rich uncle. <laughs> but if we'll pray God's will and we agree together, God has done a lot of miracles. There's one of them sitting right over there. <laughs> Amen. And then Matthew... Uh, 28 20 so if you want to turn to Matthew chapter 28 we talked about he's in the midst of us but also he said I'm with you always in verse 20 Matthew 28 20 I'm with you always even to the end of the world so there's never a time when the Lord will forsake us he'll never walk away from us he will always be with us Okay, in verse 14, I thought this was interesting. His head and hair were white like wool, like snow. So uh, let's take a look at Daniel chapter 7, because that's called a Christophany, uh, where Christ appeared in the Old Testament. So Daniel chapter 7. And we want to look at verse 9. So here's a place where the Ancient of Days appeared to Daniel. And Daniel says, I watched till the thrones were put in place and the Ancient of Days was seated. His garment was white as snow and the hair of his head was like pure wool and his throne was a fiery flame and its wheels a burning fire. So there's a lot of descriptive things in Ezekiel and in Daniel that talk about some things in heaven that are truly a mystery. And uh, some of those things we just have to take by faith. But look at chapter 10 while you're in Daniel 7. Uh, if you just turn over a couple pages, you'll be in chapter 10. We want to look at verse 6. His body was like beryl. His face was like the appearance of lightning. Who's that describing? We just read about him. His eyes were like the torches of fire. His arms and feet were like burnished bronze in color. And the sound of his words were like the voice of a multitude. So I have this uh, picture in my bedroom. And, it's, and I think it's Psalm 29. It says, the voice of the Lord is over many waters. So uh, I, I find it interesting sometimes when you need peace, you can, you can really go to the ocean and stand and listen to the waves and, and this peace will come over you. And it's because the voice of the Lord is over many waters. Uh, there's, in fact, Psalm 139 says there's no place where his voice isn't heard. So there's no language that his voice isn't understood by because his creation speaks loud about his existence. So in verse uh, 15, we're back in Revelation chapter 1. The Bible says his feet are like brass and his voice like many waters. In fact, that psalm is Psalm 29 and verse 3. The voice of the Lord is over the waters. But let's take a look at Ezekiel 43 and 2. Ezekiel 43 and verse 2. And the reason I share these backup verses is to show you that it's just not in one place in the Bible. It's in several places where Jesus is described exactly the same way. So we're going to look at Ezekiel 43 in verse 2. The Bible says, Behold, the glory of God uh, of Israel came from the way of the east. His voice was like the sound of many waters, and the earth shone with his glory. So this is the same exact description as we find here uh, where Jesus is telling John who he is. 
and John is describing what he looked like. Now some people might say, but that's Jesus, and then this is talking about God. Well, of course, Jesus is God. <laughs> and if you try to get that up here, as you know, that's difficult to do. But you get it in here. You get it in your heart by faith. So to go on here in verse 16, uh, the Bible says in Revelation 1, 16, uh, the seven stars found in verse 20, they're the messengers of the seven churches. Now I know the King James and the New King James calls them angels. But that, when you look up that word in the Greek, it's messengers, okay? So I would think they were either teachers, uh, apostles, pastors, whoever was in charge of those churches. These letters were written to them so they could read it to the body of Christ, so they could read it to the church body. So um, the angels are referred to as ones sent to minister to the heirs of salvation. So let's read about angels. I know uh, Lloyd is here today, and she actually saw the church full of angels. Do you remember that? Uh, I think you were up here when you saw them, correct? Yeah. Um, angels everywhere in the church. So God opened up her vision to see past the place that we're not to see in the sixth sense, and she saw angels everywhere. We had that happen to us one time in our uh, Bible study at my home. We had a 16-year-old uh, young man that was coming. Actually, he came for about 10 years. Uh, but uh, when he was just real young, we all were standing in a circle praying. And when I looked up after the prayer, he had tears running down his face. And I said, are you okay, Ryan? And he said he, he could hardly speak. And uh, that's indicative of, of the reaction people have when they see angels in the Bible. Uh, great fear comes upon them. And, he said, I saw angels standing on the outside of all of us, and they were shoulder to sh Were you there that night, David, when that happened? Standing shoulder to shoulder. He said, you couldn't even see between their shoulders, and they were standing all the way around us, and he said one of them had a big sword. And if you've ever seen a Damascus uh, blade on a sword, it's got these wavy lines in it. He said it looked like that. And, uh, you know, I... I only had one vision in my whole life. Uh, it was the night I accepted Jesus as my Savior. and It was this uh, inmate at the federal uh, prison who uh, used to help me deliver my Coca-Cola. And uh, I saw his face. I saw his face that night. He, he tried to tell me about the Lord several times, and I totally blew him off. And uh, one time he gave me a Bible tract and said, uh, you won't see me again. I'm going to be released. I'm going to a halfway house up near San Francisco. He said, but I want you to promise me you'll read this someday. And that night that I accepted the Lord, I, I literally saw his face in front of me. And I was prompted to go get that Bible tract and read it. And that's the night I prayed and accepted the Lord. So I haven't seen any visions since. Uh, I'd like to see angels or all that other thing, but... That's just not what God has for me right now. And maybe someday one of you will have a vision. Wouldn't that be wonderful? So in Hebrews 1, it talks about these angels. And if you'll turn there with me, the book of Hebrews, and the first chapter, Hebrews chapter 1, verse 13 and 14. The Bible says, To which of the angels has he ever said, Sit at my right hand till I make your, your enemies your footstool? And are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for those who will inherit salvation? So I want to tell you a story about my uh, daughter-in-law who lives up in Northern California. She was going out here, you know, as you go all the way down Sway, and then you can go down towards Rosemary Farms. She was on that road, and that road used to have a big deep ditch by it. And she was coming up the road, and this van was coming another, the other way. And apparently the people in the van were drunk, and they ran into her and knocked her into that ditch. And at the time it had been raining, so there was water in the ditch. And she said she remembered when the car fell this way into the ditch, uh, she started to drown. And she said, all of a sudden, there was this woman that showed up and held her head out of the water. 
and said, it's okay, the ambulance will be here soon, you're going to be okay. And um, when the ambulance got there, uh, she, she, what, she, she couldn't see her anywhere. And so she asked the, the ambulance uh, guys and, and the EMTs and the police, where's that woman that held my head out of the water? And they said, there's nobody here. You're the only one here. The people in the van that crashed, they, were, uh, they jumped out of the van and ran. So they left the van there. Uh, obviously, they didn't have a license or maybe no insurance. Who knows? But uh, she remembers that woman told her something as well. Her doctor had told her, you're not going to be able to have children. And she said while that woman was holding her head out of the water, she said, uh, your life isn't over. You're going to have a daughter. And uh, a few years later, she, she did. She had our, our granddaughter, Katie. So uh, angels are sent to minister to us. Now, I know when I was on my Harley and I went off uh, the embankment out here on 166, way before I knew the Lord, uh, I was probably doing 50 miles an hour when I was passing that semi, and then another one was coming, So, uh, I, and I believe it was an angel, or the Lord, took my handlebars and turned them, and I went off that embankment down a steep uh, embankment and hit a rock, flew off the rock. You know, you hit something at 50, you're going to get hurt. Uh, I flew off the rock and landed in my ice plant and mud, not one scratch on me. Not a scratch, not a broken bone. I was sore for the next couple of days. I was in my early 20s, but no, no severe injuries whatsoever. And I really believe with all my heart that God had sent an angel to protect me. God, God knows each one of our path. He knows our life. He knows how to protect us. He knows how to watch over us. And so he's got these beings called angels. And the Bible says in Hebrews uh, 1 and verse 14... They're ministering spirits sent to minister to us, the heirs of salvation. And we can't see them, but I can look back on my life and see how many times God protected me, and I'm sure it was angels that did it. Um, verse 16 uh, tells us that the angels are referred to in the Bible as the ones sent to minister to us, the heirs of salvation. In verse 17... John had a typical response of anybody who sees the Lord. It says, when John saw him, he fell at his feet like a dead man. And so in Ezekiel chapter 1, back to the book of Ezekiel, the prophet Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter, I almost got there. Ezekiel chapter 1. We want to look at verse 28. And verse 28 says, He looked like the appearance of a rainbow in a cloud on a rainy day. So was the appearance of the brightness all around it. And this was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. And that's exactly what John saw. I mean, it would be literally like us looking into the sun. Uh, but his brightness in his countenance was more brighter than the, whole, than the sun. So then in Isaiah 41, so if you just turn to your left from Ezekiel, in Isaiah chapter 41, there's another description of him here. And again, it's really neat to go through the Bible and see how many different places that Jesus is described exactly the same way. So, uh, Isaiah 41 and verse 4 and 5. The Bible, uh, Isaiah is saying, he, he is the one who's performed and done it, calling the generations from the beginning. I, the Lord, am the first, and with the last I am he. The coastlands saw it and they feared. The ends of the earth were afraid as they drew near and came. So I can imagine seeing the Lord and the fear that would come upon you. After all, we have a lot of illustrations in the New Testament where people saw angels and they were totally afraid. So you can imagine standing before the Lord. Of course, because we know him, we won't be afraid. 
but the nations will be afraid when they stand before him. So in verse 18, it's good to know that Jesus is alive forevermore and he has the keys. In John chapter 11, so I want to turn to the book of John here. In John 11, and starting with verse 25, this is the story of Jesus when he went to visit the grave of his friend Lazarus. So if you'll recall, they had sent word to Jesus. He was just a few miles away uh, from Bethany where Lazarus lived. And they said, our brother's sick. Can you come and, and heal him? Can you come and pray for him? And Jesus chose to stay behind for two more days. So his staying behind, Lazarus died. And so here's Jesus after two days. He goes to Bethany and he meets Martha in the road. And the first thing Martha says to him is, if you would have been here, my brother would not have died. If you'd have been here, he wouldn't have died. And then Mary meets him later and said, if you'd have been here, my brother wouldn't have died. And Jesus said, this was for the glory of God. And so he tells the people when he stands there, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believes in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whoever is living and believes in me shall never die. And I've told that story before where my grandson, uh, I was talking to him and I told him I'm never going to die. And he just said, Papa, everybody dies. And I said, no, if you believe in the Lord and you trust in him, your body may go away, but you yourself, your soul is not going to die. You're not going to die. And, uh, and that's true for each and every one of us. We will shed this skin, absolutely. Uh, it's getting older by the day, in case you didn't notice. <laughs> we're going to shed it someday. It's going to go away. But we're not going to go away. Our, our soul is going to be carried by the Spirit of the Lord. The Bible says to be absent from our body is to be present with the Lord. And uh, I, some of you have heard this, this story, but I'll just make it brief. At my dad's funeral, uh, I, I wasn't sad. I had talked to my dad. I uh, told him about the Lord, and he, he asked Christ to come into his life. Uh, he truly uh, repented of the things he had done in his life and asked God to forgive him and to come in. And so at the funeral, my, my family was falling apart. And I just kind of sat there. I knew he's, he's not in that casket. That's his body, but that's not him. That was just his container while he was on this earth. So uh, when we were on the way to the cemetery, the, the Greek priest asked me, I noticed that you weren't uh, tearful or, or sorrowful at all. Uh, and your whole family was, you know, really taking it badly. Can you explain to me why you don't seem to have any emotions about it? And I said, I'll be real honest with you. I, I shared the gospel with my dad before he died. He received Jesus as his Savior. He asked him to come in and save him. And that's not him. That's not him in the casket. We're not putting him in the ground. We're putting his container in the ground. He's already in heaven. And I shared that verse, uh, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And then I also shared John eleven twenty six: whoever's alive and believes in him will never die. And then Jesus asked this question, do you believe that? So if we believe that, he said, he that believes in me has everlasting life. So we believe by faith, God's word is true. He's changed all of us. He's still changing us. We talked about that the other night. We had a, a meeting with our uh, uh, Black Sheep Motorcycle Ministry and uh, a guy was saying, do you think we'll ever get it? And I said, yeah, we're going to get it when we get to heaven. But right now, we are a work in progress. The Bible says that in Philippians 1.6, that he who has begun a good work in you will continue to do that work until the day of Jesus Christ. So we're not going to be perfect. We're going to blow it. We're going to do things that God doesn't want us to do. But we're a work in progress. And God knows that and he continues to work with us.
us. That's why the Apostle Paul could say, I forget those things that are behind, and I reach forth towards those things that are before. And I continue to press on towards the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. That's why he could say that, because he knew, I haven't arrived. He even said that, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind. And I think sometimes we're tempted to spend too much time on what we did wrong, instead of just spending the time on where God's leading us now and what he wants us to do now. So he's alive forevermore, and he has the keys. Let's take a look at Luke chapter 24. So Matthew, Mark, and then Luke. Third book in the New Testament. Luke chapter 24. And we want to start with verse 44. And I'm going to go through verse 53 to the end of the chapter. So Jesus said to them, These are the words that I spoke to you while I was still with you that all things might be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. And then he opened their understanding so that they might comprehend the scriptures. And he said to them, Thus it is written, and it was necessary for Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins would be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. And you were witnesses of these things. Behold, I send the promise of my Father, the Holy Spirit, right? That's the promise of the Father, the Holy Spirit that comes to live with us. Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, so wait in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. And then he led them out as far as Bethany. He lifted up his hands, he blessed them, and it came to pass while he was blessing them, he was parted from them and carried up into heaven. Uh, Acts chapter 1 says carried up into the clouds. Uh, and they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. And they were continually in the temple praising and blessing God. Amen. What a sight that must have been. They saw him be crucified. They saw him taken down from the cross all bloody. They wrapped him in linen clothes, put him in a cave. And he was there for three days when, they went, when, the, when Mary and the other Marys went to see him in the morning. The stone was rolled away. He was gone the third day. He was gone. And then he shows up for 40 more days alive forevermore. He shows up witnessing. And you know, there's a lot of historical proof that Jesus did that. Not just biblical proof, but when you read things like Josephus, uh, the historian of the Jewish nation, and others, actually someone said there's more proof that Jesus walked on this earth than there is of Julius Caesar. And I have a friend who was at an antique shop somewhere back east, and he found a little tiny coin with Caesar's image on it. Uh, some little denarii, whatever they were called. And he bought it. And he said it was really expensive, but he wanted me to have it. And so there's proof right there that Julius Caesar actually lived. And people say there's more proof historically than Jesus lived than Julius Caesar. So I, I think it's so awesome to know that he's alive forevermore and he has the keys to eternal life. In verse 19... I like this about the Lord. He always leaves a record. God wants us to know the things that John saw, the things that are happening, and the things which will happen hereafter. So the book of Revelation is all about future events. It's all about things that are going to happen. And we can read, actually, Revelation 5 now and see some of the things that God was promising are coming to pass just the way he said it. And if you read Ezekiel 38 and 39 and Daniel chapter 11, you'll see that a lot of this stuff going on in the Mideast, a lot of these uh, armies that are gathering together, Iran's ramping up, these other armies are ramping up, the Euphrates River has been drying up. All of those things are in Scripture. And all of those things say, and they're written thousands of years before uh, before they actually came to pass. Uh, they were written 900 years before Jesus came to the earth, and there's been 2,000 years since. 
So we're talking almost 3,000 years before these things are actually coming to pass, but we see them. It's like reading the newspaper now. You can pick up the Bible and read exactly what you're seeing in the newspaper or hearing. Well, you don't hear too much on the news, but if you get to Newsmax or something like that, you get the real news of what's going on. So God always leaves a record. Daniel chapter 11. Uh huh, and Ezekiel 38 and 39. And both of those chapters are about the armies gathering up against Israel. And they're doing it right now. Uh, so in verse 19, God always leaves a record. So in Romans 15 and verse 4, the Bible says, the things that were written beforehand, they were written for our learning, so that we through comfort and patience from the scriptures could have hope. So all these stories that we read about, God wrote them so that we could have faith and so that we could have courage and so that we could have hope. Because when you read about all our heroes in the Bible, they were just as flaky as we are. They made bad decisions. They did things that God told them not to do. They fell down, went boom. But God always picked them back up just like he picks us up. So there's nobody going to be perfect on this earth. Only Jesus was. And we are that work in progress. So God wrote all those stories to show us this is what you're going to go through. In verse uh, John 14 and 26, I'll turn there, John 14 and verse 26, Jesus said, The Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send to you in my name, he, so that tells me right off the top, there's a cult that believes that the Holy Spirit is just God's active moving force. Okay? But the scripture says He. So the Holy Spirit is a person. And that's why we know in our heart the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, that's our God. You know? And He refers to Himself as Him. And, you know, if I were to say, you know, Tony and, and David and Natalie, I would say the names of. Tony and Natalie and David. That's proper English. But God says in Matthew, baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit had them write name, not names, because he is one God. And he works in three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So then uh, he tells us he's going to send us this comforter who's going to teach us everything. And if you look at the next chapter, John 15 and verse 26, he says, When the Helper comes, who I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father, he will testify of me. That's Jesus speaking. So the Holy Spirit's job is to glorify Jesus Christ. And the Lord Jesus' job is to glorify the Father. And that's how God operates. Okay, we're going to close this up tonight in verse 20. So I um, want to give you a down-to-earth description of a mystery. So when I joined the Navy uh, during the Vietnam conflict, um, my brother joined and, and uh, became a corpsman. Little did he know, the minute he became a corpsman, they put him into the Marines and sent him over to Vietnam uh, where he was wounded several times. So when I joined, I thought, nope, not going to do the corpsman thing. Uh, so I signed up to be a sonar technician. So I went to this school called Beep School. And it, it's a basic electronics and electricity preparatory course, B-E-E-P. So I took this course and I went to school for, I don't know, probably 11 months or so. And we learned everything you can possibly learn about electricity. And I still don't understand it. I just know when I flip the switch, it works. You know, and that's what a mystery is. A mystery is something that hasn't been fully revealed. And I know there's some scientific minds that can explain the whole thing to you. And I just tell them, well, here's a piece of wire, go make it. You know, you can read books and have theories all you want, but it's amazing to actually work with those capacitors and resistors and everything else and actually get electricity to, to move. So it is a mystery to most of us. But, so we just, by faith, 
flip on the switch. By faith, we turn the key in the car, or we push a button to start it, or we wake up in the morning and turn a, turn a knob and the water comes out. And a lot of that stuff's just a mystery that we take by faith. So why can't we take the mystery of the Lord by faith as well? Yeah, if we have to see everything, uh, the world thinks this way, you show me and I'll believe it. And God says, nope, you believe it, then I'll show you. So it's completely opposite of the way we think. So in closing tonight, uh, I guess a, a good definition is a mystery is a truth that hasn't been fully revealed. It's true, but we don't fully understand it. Okay, so in Acts chapter 1, uh, verse 7 and 8, The Bible says, he said to them, it is not for you to know the times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority. So he's telling his disciples right here, they're asking him, when are you going to come? And he's telling them, it's not for you to know that. Uh, I, I tease people and say, if God were Italian, he would say, it's none of you business. But, <laughs> but the fact of it is, there's some things that God holds to himself and we have to, by faith, believe it. Verse 8, he says, You're going to receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and then you'll be witnesses of me in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and the end of the earth. So I've broken that down into our time zone. Okay, what does it mean in Jerusalem? Well, our Jerusalem is really where we live, our home. So the first place we need to be a witness is in our own home. And then our uh, Judea could be our city or our county, a place that we're familiar with. Uh, once we get it together in our personal life, then we can go out and share it over here. And then he says in Samaria, now Samaria was a place where the Jews didn't go. So Samaria would be uh, unfamiliar territory like maybe Wyoming or Arizona or some other place. And then he said, and to the uttermost parts of the earth, we know missionaries that have gone to Africa and India and uh, Asia and all over the place. But it's interesting that he said Jerusalem first. In other words, make it work in your personal life where you live. And once you get that together, and the Holy Spirit helps us to do that, then we can step out and do it in other places as well. We're never going to get it perfect, but we really do have to, you know, I've, I've often said this, and it was true in my life. I didn't necessarily hear what my parents said. I watched what they did. And it's, it's absolutely so true. You know, kids listen to what you say, but then they watch what you do. And then parents say, I didn't tell you to do as I did. I told you to do it as I say. <laughs> and that's completely opposite. So um, 2 Timothy 3.16 tells us this. In 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16, that all the Bible, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. Now, there's some people say just a bunch of old guys wrote the Bible. No, the Bible, the Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 1 that holy men of God were moved by the Holy Ghost and they wrote those things down. They, they spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. So it was the Holy Spirit that told them what to write. And why wouldn't it be that way? I mean, Isaiah spoke 900 years before Christ came to earth the Holy Spirit told him to write this down. Unto you a son is given, unto, unto you a child is born, and the government will be on his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful, and Counselor, and the Mighty God. And then in chapter 7 he said, a virgin's going to bear a son, and you're going to call his name God with us, Emmanuel. And then that comes to pass 900 years later. Well, he didn't think that up. That was the Holy Spirit that came upon him and had him write that down. So the Bible is not men-inspired. It's God-inspired. Okay? And then Ecclesiastes 3, and I want to close with that. Ecclesiastes 3.11 
It says God will make everything beautiful in his time. It's not our time, it's his time. And I know how much we all love to wait, you know, wait in line, wait here, wait there. But the fact of it is, those who wait on the Lord will renew their strength. So, in just kind of going back over what we read tonight, God describes seven golden candlesticks that are the seven churches. And that's what we're going to be studying next week. These seven different churches that, that God confronted. Some he praised and others he rebuked for what they were doing. And it's a really interesting study. Uh, he, wanted us to re- he wanted to remind us in verse 13, he's always in the middle of us. He's always in the midst. He'll never leave. Uh, sometimes we may not even feel his presence, but we can know by faith he's, always, he's never going to leave us alone. In verse 14, the description came of him as, you know, we, we think about Jesus uh, with long hair and a beard, and it's usually brown, right? And here John says he has white hair like wool. So I think we're going to get a big surprise when we get to heaven. All those pictures we've seen of Jesus. Um, we have no idea what he'll look like, but we know his, his radiance will be like the sun. And that's what verse 15 talks about, is his feet are like fine brass, and his voice is like many waters, like rushing waters. And then the seven stars, he, he calls them angels. Uh, they're actually ministers to the heirs of salvation, to us. So have you ever heard this? We have a guardian angel. That's not true. We have more than one angel. The Bible says in Psalm 91, he will give his angels charge over you. So we at least have two. Some of us have more than two. Depends on what kind of lifestyle we have and how we need to be protected. But I know this, when you talk about angels, there's one angel in the scripture, and he wasn't an archangel, just an angel in scripture took out, uh, how many was it, David? 185,000? 185,000 uh, soldiers in one night, the enemy. 185,000. And it didn't say it took him all night. He could have done it in an instant, or he could have done it in a few minutes. But it just said overnight, so that's, that's a 12-hour period from 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. They woke up in the morning, 185,000 of their enemy lay dead on the ground. Just one angel. So if we each have two and I, I had to figure this out. We have 370,000 enemies that God can take care of. Okay, think about that. 370,000 apiece if we just have two. But if we have more, then everything gets multiplied. In other words, God will take care of us. He will take care of us. Um, in verse 17, what did John do when he saw the Lord? He fell at his feet like a dead man. That's, that's what people do when they truly meet the Lord, is fall to their knees. I know I did at my house 40, almost 44 years ago now, 43 and a half, uh, all by myself, no Bible in the house, but I felt the presence of God in my living room, and I fell to my knees and wept and asked God to forgive me of all the craziness I was involved in. And uh, that's where God meets each one of us. And he's a holy God and a righteous God. And that's our response to him. Yeah. He's alive forevermore. And he has the keys. So there's the scripture that we're going to look at in Revelation 3, verse 7 and 8. And God says, I am the one who opens the door and no man can shut it. So Frank, we prayed that over your work that God would open the door and that no man could shut it. And he truly is the one who can do that. He opens that door and no one can shut it. So when somebody says, can you pray for this job or this thing or whatever, I always pray, Lord, whatever door they're supposed to go through, close all the other doors. They Don't even let them go through them. Just open the right door and let them go through the right door, and God always opens the door. In fact, in verse 8, Revelation 3 says this, I have set before you an open door that no man can shut it because you have not denied my name. So then um, 
We look at the fact that he's got the keys, he's alive forevermore, and God always leaves a record. I like the fact that the Lord doesn't leave us in the dark. He's, this whole book of Revelation tells us what's going to happen in the future, and it's scary. But the part that I like is when he takes us, his believers, out, and that's when his wrath falls. He never said we wouldn't have any trouble. He never said we wouldn't suffer. I've, I've had people tell me, well, you know what? You said that God's the healer. How come he didn't heal me? And I said, well, your life isn't finished yet. And they said, but, you know, the doctor said I have terminal this or terminal that. God is the healer. Sometimes we get an earthly healing. And other times we get a heavenly healing. My dad got the heavenly healing. Uh, we prayed for two people in Avila Beach when I was uh, ministering up there, and they both got healed. They both had cancer. They both got healed. God healed them supernaturally. We anointed them with oil. We prayed for them like the Bible said, and they came back weeks later and said, the doctor can't find any cancer at all. So I thought, you know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fly to Arizona. My dad's dying of cancer. I'm going to go anoint him with oil and pray for him, and I did, and he died. He, he got a heavenly healing. Amen. And, and God knows what's best for our lives. He knows what's best. In fact, in Isaiah, I think it's 57. I want to make sure. He says this verse here. And this explains a lot about sometimes God does stuff that we go, what was he thinking? Why did he do that? I think it's Isaiah uh, 57.1. Yeah. 57.1. It says, the righteous perishes. Let me park right there. So there was this pastor here in town. His name was Don Long. Wonderful guy. Uh, even when I was ministering in Avila, I used to come to Santa Maria on Sunday nights and go to his church at the Foursquare Church so I could hear him uh, speak. He's a great minister. Really, really brought the Bible down where we could all reach it. So I used to love to go there and hear it. And then he got promoted uh, and got up, I think, second in command in the Four Square Church down in L.A. So they had gone to, I think it was either a conference or a game, but they were in the car on the L.A. freeway, and he drove about five minutes, and he pulled over in you know, the side of the freeway, and he, he told his wife, uh, Luann, he said, you know, I'm, I'm so tired, I don't think I can make it home. Can you go ahead and drive? So they switched seats, and she got in the driver's seat, and he got in the passenger seat, and it wasn't even one minute later. They got back on the freeway, and one of those tonneau covers on a truck came off, went through the windshield, and decapitated Don Long. And it was like, what in the world, Lord? What, what is that about? You know, why would this man of God, who was so humble and so useful to the kingdom, why all of a sudden, life gone? Well, the Bible explains it here. The righteous man perishes, and no one takes it to heart. Merciful men are taken away, while no one even considers that the righteous is taken away from the evil to come. There are some times that God sees something worse coming down the road, and I believe with all of my heart, rather than let his children go through something worse, I think God says, now it's time. I'm not going to let him or her go through that. And, uh, and only God knows. I mean, when we get there, we'll look back and understand things that have happened in our lives. Uh, man, when I lost my job, you know, for seven years, I had no money and no job. And I tried everything. Um, uh, I couldn't understand. I thought for sure it was the devil that took my job away. And it was revealed to me later, no. Uh -uh. The Lord showed me, you were getting way too happy making all this money, going on fancy vacations and doing all this. And I had called you to be a minister. And you got off track. And so I had to cut all that off in order to bring you back where, you, where I want you to be. And after all, when we say, God, why did you do that? Here's, here's what he says in Isaiah 48, verse 11. I do these things for my own name's sake, says the Lord. For my name will not be polluted, and I will not give my glory to any man. 
So in Isaiah 48, 11, everything that happens on this earth is for God's glory. And I know there's people that criticize that and say, boy, he's an egomaniac and he's a narcissist and all this other things. I just tell them, keep on blaspheming the Lord. See how that works for you. You know, there's all kinds of examples in the Bible. Uh, after all, he is the creator. It is his planet. We are his people. So he can do with us what he wants. And I believe with all my heart, God always does the right thing. And we'll understand it later. I know with my dad, personally, he was really suffering with cancer bad. And uh, he, he even told me, he said, man, I, number one, I wish I would have never took chemo. And he said, number two, I, I don't know how much longer I can hang on. This is way too much for me to handle. And I believe this is the case here. God said the righteous perish and no one lays it to heart and good men are taken away from the evil to come. God saw more evil coming down the road and said so I'm not going to let him go through that. And I just want to close with Ecclesiastes 3.11. God says I'll make everything beautiful in my time. But he's put the world in our heart not to know the work that he's doing from the beginning all the way to the end. So God says, you, you won't understand it. If you try to understand what I'm doing, you won't, you won't. And why should we? He's God, and we're not. So that's where faith comes in. That's, that's where we have to believe that he's a righteous God and he makes the right decisions. Amen? So as we go into the next couple of chapters, it'll talk. Uh, it really spoke to me, uh, almost everything in each church, of something that I need to get right or correct. So as we study these different churches, uh, the letter was for a church body like this. And he gave it to the angel, the messenger for the church to read to the entire church. And then basically it was if the shoe fits wear it. So the next couple of chapters are going to be a lot of personal ministry on what is God saying to me? And then we get into chapter 4, where that's actually when John actually gets caught up in the Spirit and gets to see what happens in the future. Uh, a lot of people think this is a scary book. I think it's a really enlightening book that opens our eyes to see what's going to happen in the future so that we're not left in the dark. So with that, uh, would you stand with me? We're going to go ahead and close. Uh, so good to have Steve here. Uh, it's great to have you. If you haven't met uh, Sandra's son, Steve, we've known each other a long time. I'm really glad you're here. Really glad you're here. Lord, thank you for the, just the time we've been able to spend looking at your word. Father, uh, with all the things that are going on on the earth right now today, it's easy to get angry. It's easy to get upset. It's easy to want to go do something about it. But Lord, just as we looked at what you had to say to us in chapter 1 tonight, you're in control. You'll never leave us or forsake us. You have the keys. And so, Lord, we have to trust you. It doesn't mean we're going to lay down. Uh, we will definitely continue to watch over those that we love and protect them. But, Lord, we know ultimately you are in control and you're allowing certain things to happen because you know that you're, you're coming and your timing is very soon. So I just pray that we would digest what we've heard tonight, think about it, uh, go back and maybe look over it again. And Lord, as we prepare to go further now into these seven churches, I pray that you will speak to me and help me to understand what needs to, to be changed in my life. And then I pray for my brothers and sisters here as well, my family, that you will speak to each one of us of, of what it is that you're trying to say to each one of us. So as we dismiss tonight, Father, thank you for the time you've given us tonight. I pray a blessing over each and every one. Might you take each and every one of us safely back home to our homes. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. You're dismissed. Thank you for being here tonight.
punishment that was due for our peace was laid.